How's everyone doing tonight? I was kind of apprehensive to come up here. I told Scott after he said I was a heathen, so I was kind of, uh, I didn't know if I was worthy or not to come up here, so, but I'm going to give it a shot anyways. But you know what? Scott did say something earlier. He said, uh, he said he likes discipleship or he likes a Wednesday night Bible study because uh, we get to take a deep dive. And uh, it was very timely what he said because we're going to take a deep dive tonight. And uh, before we even get started, well, just uh, direct you to where we're going to be for most of the night. And that is to go to the book of Jonah. Yeah, there you go. If anybody knows, knew anything about taking a deep dive, it was Jonah. Amen. But, what's that? Jonah chapter one. Yeah. There you go. Was that, was, that, was that my problem, Tim? I just forgot. To... <laughs> Jonah chapter 1. Yeah. <laughs> I've got it somewhere here. I want to thank Pastor, as usual, for uh, allowing me to stand up here tonight in his uh, absence, to break the, the bread, to break bread, the Word of God, and just to share and expound. And as I said, we're going to take a deep dive tonight, and we're going to, we're going to study... This man named Jonah, this prophet named Jonah, and uh, look at some of the, the shortfalls, the shortcomings that uh, this man had in his life. Amen. So as we begin tonight, I just uh, I want to open up. I just want to talk about one of my favorite uh, people in history. Um, Winston Churchill is one of my favorite people in history. Winston Churchill, Ronald Reagan, George Washington, of course, Jesus himself the man of history, his story, everything about the Bible was his story, it's history. But Winston Churchill was a great man, and he still today remains a great historical figure. His legacy is pronounced and everlasting. He was a great leader. He was perhaps the greatest prime minister that England has ever known. He was a highly educated man of great intellect. He was an articulate speaker, an individual who possessed great wit and humor. Now, Churchill's been quoted many times in many ways, but I want to give you one of his most memorable and humorous quotes this evening. Now, whether or not he coined this quote, this phrase or not, I don't know. But he is, uh, he's known for saying it. He once said, where there is a will... I want to be in it. Let me say that one more time because nobody laughed at it. Where there's a will, I want to be in it. There you go. <laughs> Obviously, this quip from Winston Churchill refers to uh, reaping a financial windfall as a result of being the beneficiary of someone's last will and testament. If there's someone's will, he wanted to be in it. However, I want to draw your attention to a different kind of will this evening. A will that is an act of volition, a predisposed decision to take action that brings about a desired end, an act that is executed according to the principles and wisdom devised by a higher power. When I say higher power, men, I don't mean your wives. I don't mean your bosses. I don't mean your government, but I mean God Almighty, God Himself. God has a will, and God has a way for all of us. Oftentimes, His will is singular in nature. It can be simplistic, or it can be multifaceted and seem somewhat complicated. We can choose, as with everything in this life here on this earth, to seek God's will, that is to fulfill it or to find a means of escape to avoid completing it. Amen? No one who is part of God's kingdom can avoid the call of His will. Do you know, as children of the living God, as God's people, that each and every one of you seated here tonight in this sanctuary, each and every one of you looking at me online right now, God has a will for your life. And you have a choice whether or not you want to complete that will, whether you want to fulfill that will. Amen. No one, no one is separate from walking in the will of God. Jesus, the head of the church, 
His mission here on earth was to fulfill the will of the Father. I'll give you some scriptures. It was Jesus' purpose. John chapter 6 and verse 38. For I came down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him that sent me. It was his provision. Jesus said unto them, this is John chapter 4 and verse 34. Jesus saith unto them, my meat, my sustenance is to do the will of him that sent me and to finish his work. And it was also his passion. In John, the same gospel, John chapter 5 and verse 30, Jesus said, I can of myself do nothing. As I hear, I judge, and my judgment is righteous because I do not seek my own will, but the will of the Father who sent me. Listen to me, church. Jesus did not waver. Jesus did not wonder. And Jesus did not wander. None of those things do we see happening to Jesus in the Bible. Jesus was always on point. Jesus was always, he was proactive. Why was he proactive? Because he was right in the middle of the will of the Father. Now you may have determined in your hearts and in your minds already tonight that my topic for this evening is operating in the will of God. And you're partially correct. But it's more than that. It's a cautionary message. It's a cautionary message about being outside of the will of God. Do you know that's possible? Do you know you're capable of being outside of the will of God? So Rob, my, the title for my message tonight is The Dangers of Descent. The Dangers of Descent. Now let's just take Churchill's quote for a moment and change it a little bit. Churchill said, where there is a will, I want to be in it. Let's change it to say, where there is the will of God, I want to be in the middle of it. Amen. Amen? That should be the proclamation of all of God's people. Each and every one of you here tonight, God, as I said, has a will for your life, a purpose for your life, and you should say, I want to be right in the middle of God's will. Yet many Christians, they choose to walk outside of His will. Amen? God's will is perfect. Why? Because God, in His infinite wisdom, His plans and His purposes are perfect. Amen? Whatever He's called us to do, we should want to do it accordingly. We should do it exactly the way that He wants us to do it. Now, here on this earth, our will, what we want can be defined, and it can be victorious. I want to do it this way. I can do it this way, or I want to do it that way. Sometimes our will prevails. Sometimes our will must be compromised. Earlier this week, my hair was long. I wanted to get a haircut. You may have noticed I got it cut. No more salt and pepper. Amy likes my hair long. I don't want you to get your hair cut. You buzz it all off and you look like an old man. No offense to you old men out there. But I got my hair cut and I told my barber to ease off a little bit. So it's a little longer than it usually is. It's not so high and tight. So we compromised. Amen. So our will can prevail. Our will sometimes must be compromised to make our, our better halves happy. Amen? <laughs> but there's other times where God is concerned that our will must be submitted to Him. Amen? And His will must prevail. His will must prevail. Let me tell you something. Four years ago, it'll be four years in October... Down in the fellowship hall, before serving communion, there was a couple down there named Larry and Carlotta Bennett. Now, at that time, the Bennetts did not know it, but at that time, God had been pressing something on my heart, a desire to help and to provide spiritual leadership to law enforcement, first responders. I had never met, we had never met Larry and Carlotta before. That was the first time that I'd ever seen him here. And of course, I was overseeing communion in the fellowship hall. I'd seen Larry's table out back, so I knew who he was. I knew what he did. He was a chaplain. 
As I'm standing there waiting for communion to take place, a lot of chit chat and small talk going on, God spoke to me. He said, go over there and introduce yourself to that man. Sit down and share your heart with him. You know what my first reaction was? <laughs> no, no, no. This guy's been doing this for decades. This guy's been doing this for decades. I have done nothing. I've done nothing in comparison to what he's done. Who am I compared to him? But God said, go introduce yourself to him. Not only say hi, but sit down and share your heart with him. So I did what God told me to do. I sat down with Larry. I shared my heart with him. And you know, the following summer, Amy and I found ourselves out in Wichita Falls, Kansas, at the International Conference of Police Chaplains. I was getting my training. I was getting my education units to become a law enforcement chaplain. And here I'm today, here I am today, credentialed with ICPC. I wear their pin. I'm sworn to the sheriff's office, sworn into the sheriff's office, to Lewisburg and Eaton PD. In just a small window of time, it happened. And just think, if I hadn't listened to God and stepped out and done what he told me to do, that was God's will for me, to talk to Larry. And Larry, being the man that he was, put me on a trajectory to get where I needed to be. Amen? Hallelujah. He's in glory right now. But he was my mentor and my friend. And everything that I will do, I will do to honor him as I honor God in this ministry that he has placed me in. Amen. But God's not done with me yet. He still has a will for me. It's called a full-time ministry. Amen. And God's fighting with me on that. Because it's going to take a lot of faith. But it's going to happen. Amen. But my point is, is that whatever God's will is for your life, honor it. Honor it and do everything that is within you to fulfill it. Because you will be blessed. You will be blessed beyond measure, even if it's not directly about you. Amen? As I was saying before I went off on this rabbit trail, many choose to walk outside of God's will. The reasons are many. The reasons could be fear, unworthiness, ignorance, opposition, disagreement with what God wants you to do. We're going to talk about somebody that had that problem tonight. But it all equates to one word. Defiance. Defiance. Defiance is what I want to focus on tonight. Defying God and His will can create many pitfalls and it can be downright dangerous for you for your life and for your ministry. This word, the title, as I said tonight, is the dangers of dissent. This word dissent is defined as withholding approval, to take a differing opinion, non-conformance, non-conformance or just direct opposition. Do, now, when you think about those words that I just read, does, does, that, does that something that you want to do where God is concerned? Do you want to disapprove? of him, of his, of his plan? Do you want to take a different opinion? Do you want to not conform? That sounds like a rebellious spirit, doesn't it? Imagine a child of God doing any of these things in response to God's plan, his purpose, to, to his will. What are the results of defiance? What are the dangers of dissent? Have you made your way to Jonah yet? It's just four little chapters. See, that's why I gave you this big opening, because I knew that little minor prophet there in the Old Testament, it would take you a little while to get there to those three or four or six pages, whatever they are. Are you there in Jonah? Because we're going to talk about Jonah tonight. Jonah chapter 1 and verse 1. Now the word of the Lord came unto Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry against it, for their wickedness is come up before me. God is presenting to Jonah the prophet. By the way, in case you didn't know it, Jonah was a prophet. You know how I know that? Because he's in the book of prophets. 
Also because I've seen the Veggie Tales movie, Jonah, and they sang this song, Jonah was a prophet, ooh, ooh. <laughs> if anybody's seen the movie, you'll know what I'm talking about. It was one of Donnie's favorites. <laughs> but he was a prophet. He was a man of God. And what is, what is my point? It doesn't matter what level you are in God's kingdom. If you are down here at the bottom, or if you're all the way up at the top, if you're a man called Jonah, you can fall into this pitfall called descent and defiance. Amen? But God is sharing his will with Jonah. And he's telling Jonah, I want you to be a part of it, Jonah. I want you to go to Nineveh, and I want you to cry against the people of Nineveh, for their wickedness. He's saying this word cry means to preach. I want you to go preach a salvation message to these people of Nineveh because I want to I save them. I want to I save them from their destruction. So Jonah has been tasked to go to Nineveh, this place of... Some say at the end of this book, you'll find where it says 120,000 people. But I've read in some other areas and some other writings that it was upwards of 600,000 to a million people. So God has tasked this one man, this mighty man of God, to go to Nineveh and preach a salvation message to these people. Jonah has received his marching orders, arise and go to Nineveh. But then the descent begins. It didn't take any time, folks. It was like it went in the ear and the descent begins. Verse 3, it says, But Jonah rose up to what? To flee unto Tarshish. From where? From the presence of the Lord. He was not only running from the will of God, the, 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 the assignment that God had given him, but he was running from God himself. He wanted nothing to do with this. You know why? Because Jonah viewed the people of Nineveh, Nineveh as evil and wicked. Jonah had an idea in his own head, in his own heart, about how these people should be dealt with. And it wasn't through God's saving grace. Amen? So he said, I'm going to hightail it to Tarshish. I don't want to do this. A prophet, man. A man of God. Running from God's will. And there we find the first danger of descent, and that is that we distance ourselves from God. We distance ourselves from God. Once Jonah received his marching orders, Jonah began to distance himself from God and from God's will. So much that he went in the opposite direction from which God had called him to go. Now, I just want you to think about it. This is where Jonah is at. He's in, he's in Joppa, okay? Nineveh's right here, 550 miles to the east. Tarshish is all the way over here, 2,500 miles to the west. He decides he's going to go to Tarshish. He's going to hightail it. He's not only going to go, he wasn't just going to go outside of Joppa and hide. He's going to go all the way out in the wilderness. He's going to go all the way out in the wilderness. What happens when you take yourself outside of the will of God? You go out in the wilderness. You walk out into the darkness. And that's just what Jonah did. He decided he, he was going to take a slow boat to Tarshish. He was literally, he was in direct opposition to the will of God. God wanted him to go here. He went exactly the opposite direction. A man of God. A man of God. This is a very dangerous place to be. If God has called you to something, church, listen to me. Have not the heart of Jonah that says, I'm out of here. That's right. But have the heart of another prophet, the prophet Isaiah. Why don't you hold your place here in the book of Jonah and just go over to the book of Isaiah, chapter 6, not too far away. It's the major prophet Isaiah. Verse 8, Isaiah chapter 6 and verse 8, he writes, the prophet writes, Also I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send? And who will go for me? Then said I, then said the prophet Isaiah, what did he say? Here am I, Lord. 
Here am I. Send me. He didn't hem all around. He didn't sit there and contemplate it and sit at the dining room table with his wife and say, I don't know if I can do this or not. He said, here I am. Immediate response, send me. And he said, God said, go and tell the people. And Isaiah went and told the people. Amen. Hallelujah. The Lord said, go and tell the people. And Isaiah obeyed. The Lord said to Jonah, go to Nineveh and cry against it. And Jonah on purpose went in the opposite direction. From Joppa to Nineveh was just a short distance. But he went all the way on the other side, all the way out on the back 40, if you would. He did everything possible to distance himself from the plan of God. Both for his life, now listen to me, both for his life and for the people of Nineveh. See, it wasn't just about Jonah. There's a whole lot of other people involved in this. A whole lot of other people. But Jonah chose to think about himself and step out of the will of God. Jonah, as I said before, had perceived these people to be evil and wicked and thought that they deserved judgment. Anybody ever been like that before? Sure, we've all been that way before. I'll admit to it. You know, and that guy just needs his comeuppance, man. But then the God, God that I that I serve, his Holy Spirit will say, You don't mean that, do you? Jonah sought to escape from the will of God. Can I give you another example besides the prophet Isaiah of someone that chose to be in the will of God? Hold your finger there in Jonah and let's go over to the book of Acts chapter 9. And as we look at this story here in the book of Acts chapter 9, you can hold your finger there in the book of Acts as we go back and forth because we'll go back to Jonah, but we'll also be revisiting the book of Acts once again. But in the book of Acts, chapter 9, I want to illustrate to you the heart of another man that chose to do and to fulfill the will of God. It was a man named Ananias. And I ask you, as we begin to read this passage, what if Ananias had the same heart that Jonah had? Amen? Now, I'm not talking about the Ananias that was uh, married to Sapphira. That's not the Ananias I'm talking about. In chapter 9 of the book of Acts, we'll start in verse 10. Now, in the previous nine verses, you will find Paul, or Saul of Tarsus, was on his road to Damascus. And he had been knocked off of his high horse. And he'd been led by his crewmen, by his guys, to the city of Damascus. And he was holed up in a, in a house praying. But the word of the Lord came to, to a man named Ananias in verse 10. And there was a certain disciple at Damascus named Ananias. And to him said the Lord in a vision. Now, my, my, uh, my letters are read here in this passage. So that tells me that it was the head of the church directly talking to Ananias. Amen. Jesus himself said, Ananias. And now I want you to look at what Ananias says, his immediate response. And he said, behold, I am here, Lord. Behold, I am here, Lord. Remember what Isaiah said in response to the Lord? He said, here I am, Lord. Here, here I am. Ananias says, I am here, Lord. He immediately steps up at attention. Yes, sir. What can I do for you, sir? And the Lord said unto him, Arise and go into the street, which is called Straight, and inquire in the house of Judas for one called Saul of Tarsus. For behold, he prayeth. And he has seen in a vision a man named Ananias coming in and putting his hand on him that he might receive his sight. Now, can I, can I submit to you that this man Ananias was directly centered in the will of God? 
Why? Because he was so close to God Almighty that the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords rose up and spoke to him. He heard him immediately. He not only heard him immediately, but then Jesus gave him a word of knowledge. He was flowing in a spiritual gift. Jesus said, there's a man praying and I want you to go see him. Now Ananias does next what he does next. We can all do. He begins, he he questions God. You know, if God has given you something, He's put something on your heart, Kristen. If He's put something on your heart, it's okay to question Him. It's okay. Sometimes He'll give you an answer. Sometimes He'll say, you're just going to have to walk it out by faith. Full-time ministry. (laughs) Amen. But Ananias begins to question the Lord. He says, it says in verse 13, Then Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard by by many of this man how much evil he has done to the saints at Jerusalem. And here he has authority from the chief priest to bind or arrest all that call on thy name. Ananias says, Lord, do you know who you're talking about? (laughs) Do you know who you're talking about? And you want me to go see him and lay hands on him and give him a message? Come on. Come on. Might I I ask you a question? What if Paul never had that experience with Jesus on the Damascus road? What if there never would have been an obedient man like Ananias to go do what God told him to do, what Jesus told him to do? One of the greatest men, one of the greatest preachers, one of the greatest writers of the New Testament, who wrote most of the New Testament, may not even have fulfilled his ministry. Hallelujah. But the Lord, verse 15, But the Lord said unto him, to Ananias, Go thy way, for he is a chosen vessel unto me, to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. For I will show him... How great things he must suffer for my name's sake. Ananias is right there in God's will again, right in the middle of it again. Why? Because he's flowing in another spiritual gift. God, Jesus, had not only given him a word of knowledge, he's now given him a word of wisdom. This is my plan. This is my future for this man, Paul. Just go do it. And what happens in the next verse? And Ananias went his way. Never hear another question out of his mouth. He went his way and he entered into the house and putting his hands on him said, Brother Saul, look at this. He's not only condemning that man as he was a few verses ago, he's now calling him what? Brother. Brother Saul. Brother Saul, the Lord, even Jesus that appeared unto thee in a way as thou camest, has sent me that thou mightest receive thy sight and be filled with the Holy Ghost. Hallelujah! Ananias is fulfilling the will of God. And immediately there fell from his eyes as it had been scales, and he received sight forthwith, and he arose and was baptized. And look what happens next. And when he had received meat, he was strengthened. Then was Saul certain days with the disciples which were at Damascus, and straightway he preached Christ in the synagogues that he is the Son of God. Wow! Glory to God! Ananias not only got to go and lay hands and pray with this man named Saul, who would become Paul, but then he released him into his ministry and he saw him go and preach his first message. What's my point? See, it didn't look like there's anything in it for Ananias. There wasn't any blessing for him. I, I would submit to you that it was otherwise. He sent this man Paul on a trajectory to fulfill his ministry. He preached his first message in a few days, all because of what Ananias did. I call that a blessing. Amen. I call that a blessing. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Don't be a Jonah. Be an Isaiah. Be an Ananias. When your commander, the head of the church, calls you out and he calls his people out and you all come up rank and file before him, 
Don't just stand there. Step out. Amen? And just don't stand there with everybody else or wait for everybody else to take a step back and leave you standing up there all by yourself. Commit to it. Yes, Lord. Here I am. Here am I. Send me. Amen? Don't distance yourself from God. Run to God and run to His plan. Amen? Let's go back to Jonah. Should be easier for you to find this time. So the first danger of descent that we see, what was it? That we distance ourselves from God. The danger, first danger of descent is that we distance ourselves from God. The next one is, is that we position ourselves for disaster. We position ourselves for disaster. Look in verse 4 of chapter 1 of Jonah. But the Lord sent out a great wind into the sea, and there was a mighty tempest in the sea, so that the ship was like to be broken. So here we have Jonah. He's on his way to Tarshish. He's running for them from the plan of God. And what does God do in response? God sends a storm. God sends a storm. It says that the ship was like to be broken. This literally means in danger of being wrecked. In danger of being wrecked. A lot of times when you run from the will of God, you can find yourself shipwrecked. Amen? You can, if we find ourselves in direct opposition or defiance to God's will, we can also find ourselves on a path to be shipwrecked spiritually or ministerially. We just run, we hit roadblocks. Everywhere we turn, there's a roadblock. Not only did Jonah position himself for disaster, but he purposed himself to be distracted. So there's a little, there's a little extra one in there for you, a little extra danger, that he was distracted. He was distracted while, while this storm was going on on the seas. Where, where's Jonah? Look in verse 5. It says, Then the mariners were afraid and cried every man unto his God. All these different men that were on the boat, the crewmen, they have all their different gods. They're crying out and they're praying to their God and cast forth their wares. They're throwing everything overboard, everything that was on the ship, that were in the ship into the sea to lighten it of them. But Jonah was gone down into the sides of the ship. And what was he doing? He lay and he was fast asleep. It says that he was gone down into the sides of the ship. Now I'm just guessing, but I'm thinking if there's any further that Jonah could go, that he would have went. If he could have embedded himself into the wood of the bottom of the ship, he would have done it. He was distracted. He was asleep. And all these guys are up on the deck crying, crying out to their God. They're, they're scuttling the ship. They're throwing everything overboard. And Jonah's down there sawing logs without a care in the world. Why? Because he chose to dis distance himself. He chose to distract himself. I'm just going to take a nap. I don't care when we get there. Verse 6, So the shipmaster came to him and said unto him, what meanest thou, O sleeper? <laughs> what are you doing asleep? What is wrong with you? Arise, get up, call upon thy God. If so, be that God will think upon us that we not perish. <laughs> Let me, the prophet, he just checked out, if you would. He just checked out. You know, if it were modern times, he'd probably be down there on his tablet or something, playing a game or something with his headphones on or his earbuds in. God's cause was not, his cause was not his cause, and if need be, he was going to go down with the ship. And then at the behest of the crew, he finally owns up to the fact that the situation that they are in is because of his disobedience. Not in so many words, but that it was for his sake. They sat up there on the deck and they're casting lots to see who was the problem. Who was the reason that this thing was happening? And they determined that it was this man Jonah because the lot landed on Jonah. And in verse 9 it says, And he said unto them, that being Jonah, I am a Hebrew, and I fear the Lord, the, and I fear the Lord God of heaven, which has made the sea and the dry land. And then were the men exceedingly afraid and said unto him, Why have you done this to us?
See, he had no concern for the people of Nineveh, and he had no concern for the people on the ship that were taking him in the direct opposite direction of Nineveh. He was all about king self. All about king self. Why hast thou done this? For the men knew that he fled from the presence of the Lord because he had told them. He had told them. In verse 11, they said, Then said they unto him, What shall we do unto thee that the sea may be calm unto us? For the sea wrought and was tempestuous. Now, I want you to look and see what he says in this next verse. You know, he could have just solved all of his problems. He could have solved the cruise problems right there if he would have just chosen to what? Step back into the will of God. But what did he do? What did he say? Verse 12, And he said unto them, Take me up and cast me forth into the sea. So shall the sea be calm unto you, for I know that for my sake the great tempest is upon you. He said, they just throw me overboard. Throw me in the water. Everything will be all right for you guys after that. That is his mindset, folks. That is his mindset. Imagine if Jonah had only acquiesced and put himself back into the will of God. The fear, more so of the crew than Jonah, of sure disaster would have been assuaged. But he said, throw me in. Throw me in. So let's contrast Jonah's nautical journey with the not with a nautical journey of another man. I ask you to hold your place in the book of Acts. Go back with me to that book, to the Acts chapter twenty-seven. Don't lose your place in Jonah, but go with me to Acts chapter twenty-seven. Jonah was on a nautical journey in the book of Jonah. In Acts 27, we, fought, we find the Apostle Paul. Again, we're talking about Paul also on a nautical journey. Paul is on his way to Rome. Paul was put on a boat on its way to Rome in the wrong time of the year. Paul knew this. And I'll read it to you, just so you understand it too. He knew this was the wrong time to go. In verse, chapter 27, in verse, where do I want to start here? Verse 8, And hardly passing, it came into a place which is called the Fair Havens, near whereunto was the city of Lycia. Now when much time was spent, and when sailing was now dangerous, because the fast was now already passed, Paul admonished them. He advised them. And he said unto him, Sirs, I perceive that this voyage will be with hurt or with danger and much damage, not only of the lading in the ship, but also of our, of our lives. Paul knew that this was a bad time to be going out on the water. It was a bad time of the year. And as they all found out, what happened? They got involved in the same type of storm that the men that Jonah did on that boat going to Tarshish. Verse 13, it said, And when the south wind blew softly, supposing that they had obtained their purpose, hey, we are on our way now, folks. Loosened thence, they sailed close by Crete. Verse 14, But not long after there arose against it a tempestuous wind called Eurachlidon or Eurachlidon. And when the ship was caught and could not bear up into the wind, we let her drive. Just let her go. Which when they had taken up, they used helps undergirding the ship and fearing lest they should fall into the quicksands, strake sail, and so were driven. And we being exceedingly tossed with the tempest, the next day they lightened the ship. Does that sound familiar to you? They lightened the ship. They began to throw everything overboard. If it's not bolted down, if we don't need it, get rid of it. And the third day, verse 19, we cast out with our own hands the tackling of the ship. There goes the ropes, there goes the bows, all, the, all that stuff. You can tell I'm a boat man, right? 
And when neither sun nor stars in many days appeared and no small small tempest lay on us, all hope that we should be saved was then taken away. They had lost all hope. But look at Paul. Look at Paul. But after long abstinence, Paul stood in the midst of them and said, Sirs, you should have listened to me. You should have listened to me. And you should not have loosed from Crete to have gained this harm and loss. And now I exhort you to be of good cheer. See, first he chastised them, but then he gives them the good news. He says, I exhort you to be of good cheer, for there shall be no loss of any man's life among you, but of the ship. For there stood by me this night the angel of God. And what's he say after that? Whose I am and whom I serve. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Paul understood who he was. Paul understood where he was going. Paul understood his purpose. Paul understood that regardless of the fact that those that had him in shackles chose to put him on a boat destined for destruction, that he was not going to end up in destruction. Why? Because the angel of the Lord told him so and reminded him in verse 24, saying, Fear not, Paul. Thou must be brought before Caesar. And lo, God has given thee all them that sail with thee. God's going to spare all of you, Paul, because you are on a mission. You are in the will of God and nothing's going to stop it from happening. And Paul tells the crew, wherefore, sirs, be of good cheer, for I believe God. Do you believe God? Do you believe God and his will for your life? For I believe God that it shall be even as it was told me. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. See, both of these men, Paul and Jonah, found themselves in a perilous situation. They were both consumed by a tempestuous storm and what would appear to be disaster. One of the dangers of descent. However, being in the will of God, Paul received reassurance from God in his safety and his fulfillment of the call that God had given him. God reassured him. God came up beside him and said, son, it's going to be all right. It's going to be all right. Paul, you're going to Rome. You're going to Rome and nothing's going to stop you from getting there. Jonah didn't have that reassurance. And as a result, he requested, as we've seen already in verse 12 of the chapter 1 of Jonah, he requested that they cast him into the sea. And if you go back to that book, Jonah, we'll see that they obliged him. They gave him what he had requested. Verse 12, he said, take me up and cast me forth into the sea. And now these guys, they tried to do everything they could. You know, they tried to row this boat. They tried to get it in the right direction. They tried to spare it. And then when it wouldn't work, they just, they, they appealed to the Lord. And they said, forgive us, Lord. But this guy's going over. He's going over. Verse 15, so they took up Jonah and cast him forth into the sea. And what happened? The sea ceased. From raging. Just like that. Just like that. The sea ceased from raging. So we find Jonah in this vicious cycle, the dangers of descent. He distances himself from God. He decides to distract himself from God. He winds up in a disastrous situation as a result. But now I, I, I want to show you that he winds up in a point of distress. A point of distress. Another danger of descent, of defying God and His plan, His will for your life. Look at verse 17. Actually, let's start in verse 15 again. So they took up Jonah and cast him forth into the sea, and the sea ceased from her raging. So now we find Jonah floating aimlessly in the sea. And this is where his defiance has gotten him, as I said. The waters have calmed, and who knows? You know what I was thinking? That, wow, he, he's out there floating on some driftwood, or maybe they threw him a life raft or something. 
And he just pops up a parasol. He says, I'm still not going to Nineveh. I'm still not going to Nineveh. Why do I say that? Why do I say that? Cue the Jaws music. Dun -dun. Dun -dun. Verse 17. Now the Lord had prepared a great fish to swallow up Jonah. And Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. Why do I say that? Because if he'd have been floating out there on some driftwood or in his lifeboat, and he'd have said, Lord, I'm sorry. I got you now. I understand your will. Give me a nice easterly wind and send me on my way to Nineveh and I'll do what you told me to do. But that's not what happened, is it? No. Shoom. The big whale comes up. The big whale comes up and swallows him. Swallows him whole. So now he's sitting in the belly of the whale. Got his little candle. His Old Testament. You can laugh. That's okay. His plan of opposition was still in action, and he's found himself in the belly of a whale. He was in a bad way, and he was brought to a point of distress. You can read most of chapter 2 of the book of Jonah, and it's all about him praying and reaching out, crying out to God. How do I know he's praying? Because in verse 1 it says, Then Jonah prayed unto the Lord. He prayed unto the Lord. See, when you put yourself in direct opposition to God's will, to His perfect plan, you're going to find yourself in a bad way where nothing seems to go right. I, mean, I don't know. You might find yourself on a blubber mattress. You might find your... but you know, It may not go that far, but you'll find yourself floating aimlessly with no direction. Amen? Amen? You may look around and find yourself in heaven's woodshed. Don't let it come to that. Don't let it come to that. Fulfill God's will for your life. And that's where Jonah found himself. God finally got his attention after three days. He cried out to God. He lamented to God. And finally in verse 9, he says, But I will sacrifice unto thee with the voice of thanksgiving. I will pay that that I have vowed. God, I will do whatever you want me to do. Salvation is of the Lord. Sounds like a new preacher, doesn't it? A transformed man. And what did God do in verse 10 of chapter 2? And the Lord spake unto the fish, and it vomited out Jonah unto the dry land. I don't know how close they were to dry land, but uh, that must have been a projectile vomit. Just sent him. <laughs> he landed on the beach. He landed on the beach. The Lord released him from his aquatic prison. You know what will happen if you get back, you get right with the will of God? If you repent of your rebellion as Jonah did and lay it at God's feet, he'll put you back on the path that he has ordained for you. Now, it may not be at the same location or going in the same direction, it could be, because we'll find out that Jonah was going in the same way that he was told to go. But he will put you back on a path forward. He'll put you back on the path forward nonetheless. Amen? So we find Jonah, he's, he's distanced himself from God. He purposely distracted himself from God. He found himself in the midst of disaster. None of that had any impact on him. To the point where God swallowed him up with big blue and he's at a, got reached a point of distress where he's just crying out, crying out to God. Okay, God, I'll do it, I'll do it, I'll do it, I'll do it. But then we're going to find out that he was only delaying the inevitable. He was only delaying the inevitable. He said, God, I'll do what you tell me to do. Just get me out of this whale. And God did it. And then look at chapter 3 and verse 1. It kind of resembles chapter 1, verse 1. And the word of the Lord came unto Jonah the second time. Jonah, arise and go to Nineveh, that great city, and preach unto, the pre preach unto it the preaching that I bid thee. 
Jonah thought he skirted the whole issue. God had another plan for him, amen? God had another plan for him. Actually, it was the same plan that God had for him. Jonah had just delayed the inevitable. Jonah was on the same pathway, the same purpose, and the same trajectory that God had given him and sent him on in chapter 1, verse 1 of this book. Jonah was God's man for for the Nineveh mission. Say that real fast three times. And after all his descent, that plan hadn't changed. Look at me. God's will shall be fulfilled. Amen? God's will shall be fulfilled. Get in on the blessing. Get in on the blessing. Maybe he's calling you to witness to your neighbor or your co-worker. Dr. Rothwell, maybe he's calling you to buy your neighbor a banana split. Yeah, he already did it, but I think he's done it more than once. But God's calling us all to do something. He's calling us all to do something. Maybe he's calling you to sow into an individual that has a financial need or to be a voice in someone's life who they themselves are shipwrecked. To be a voice for those without a voice. 40 million dead babies. Stand up, church. The time is now. Act as God moves upon you to act. Time could be of the essence. God knows things about people and situations that we don't. A witness to someone may write their name down in heaven before they are called into eternity. An encouraging word could keep a life from falling apart. A financial blessing could keep a family or ministry from falling apart. We don't know what a day brings for any of us. But God does. And through His wisdom, His providence, and His sovereignty, He chooses us, His people, His body, to do the work of Christ. We are called to be salt and light. Dr. Rothwell stirred me up last week. I'll I'll quote another scripture that he gave us last week. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Matthew 5 and verse 16. Or how about Isaiah 60 and verse 1, Old Testament. Arise, shine, for your light has come and the glory of the Lord is risen upon you. You don't know what other people are going through. You don't know what other situations people are enduring or what they're facing. Maybe they don't even know. But God's trying to set you up to help them, to set them up, to get victory or to put them in a place where they'll be safe. There's an old story about a rich merchant of Baghdad who had a servant. And a servant came to him and said, Master, I want you to give me one of your best horses. I must flee. And the merchant said to a servant, why do you need to flee? The servant replied, I was in the marketplace today and a sinister figure jostled me. And I turned and I looked in his face and I was staring in the face of death. Master, give me a horse. He said, I must flee to Samara. And the master loving his servant said, take my best horse and flee if you will. And then a rich merchant went to the marketplace, and there he himself saw death. And he said, Death, why did you startle my servant when you saw him? And death said, I didn't mean to startle your servant. It was your servant that startled me. I didn't expect to see him here. I have an appointment with him tonight in Samara. You don't know what a day brings. You don't know what future holds for the person standing or sitting next to you, working next to you, living next to you, shopping next to you. You don't know what's coming next in their life. But if God has called you to say or to do or to act on their behalf, don't delay and do it. Again, we have 
We know not what a day brings. Answer the call, fulfill the will of God, and put the scent and your desires aside for His glory and for His perfect plan. Let your light shine and the glory of God illuminate the world around you. So we see after much pushback, God's will for the people of Nineveh is finally fulfilled. Jonah preaches the gospel or he preaches the good message to these people. He preaches salvation. They repent. They repent. There's repentance in Nineveh. So much repentance that God even gets involved. In verse 10 of chapter 3, and God saw their works and they turned from their evil way and God Himself even repented. God changed His mind of the evil that He had said that He would do unto them and He did it not. Hallelujah. Repentance all around, folks. God knew what He was going to do. God knew He was going to spare Nineveh. He changed His mind and would not destroy these people. It was His plan all along. And He wanted Jonah to be a part of it. (laughs) But what did Jonah do? He prayed unto the Lord and said, Thee, O Lord, was not this my saying? When I was yet in my country... This is chapter 4, verse 2, by the way. Therefore I fled before unto Tarshish, for I knew that thou art a gracious God and a merciful God, slow to anger and of great kindness, and repentest thee of evil. I knew what you were going to do, God, but I didn't think that they deserved it. I didn't think they were worthy of it. He's still messed up, folks. He's still defying God. Begrudgingly, Jonah made it happen. He finally obeyed God, but there was no rejoicing in his heart. And now he would slump, he would slink into depression. The last danger of descent. Verse 3, Jonah says, Therefore now, O Lord, take, I beseech thee, my life from me, for it is better for me to die than to live. What kind of situation is this guy in? What is his mindset? God just spared hundreds of thousands of people, saved them. And Jonah's saying, what do you do, God? I've had enough. Take me out. I I, I don't want any more of it. And God said to him in verse 4, Then the Lord said, Doest thou well to be angry? He calls him out. He says, Jonah, do you have any right to be angry? But then Jonah, you can read the rest of it because I'm out of time. But then Jonah stubbornly storms off to a high place. He stubbornly storms off to a high place. You know what Jonah reminds me of? He reminds me of a story. There's a little boy in discipleship class. He keeps standing up. He's a distraction to the class. The teacher says, Billy, sit down. Billy doesn't sit down. He just keeps standing, being a distraction. Billy, I said, sit down, Billy. Billy won't sit down. Finally, the teacher comes over to him, puts her hands on his shoulders and says, Billy, sit down. So Billy sits down and he crosses his arms like this and he looks at the teacher and he says, I'm standing up on the inside. That's Jonah. That's Jonah. Stubbornness, defiance. He's standing up on the inside and nothing, nothing, not even the goodness, the grace, the mercies of God can change his heart, can change his countenance. Don't be a Jonah. Jonah chose to go his own way, and as a result, every step was a misstep met with calamity. He defied God, and because of his descent, it seemed that danger was around every corner. He distanced himself from God. He experienced disaster, distress, and depression. He delayed in God's calling, and while he, the Lord's will, was fulfilled, Jonah, it would seem, missed the blessing. Don't miss the blessing. Don't miss the blessing. As Rod Serling said, there's a signpost up ahead. There's a fork in the road. Which route, which route, however you want to say it, will you choose? God's or your own? May we learn from the mistakes of this prophet. Amen? Amen? Stand with me this evening.